It's the Black Real Estate Dialogue. Tune in. Tune in. Tune in. Tune in. Tune in. Tune in. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Black Real Estate Dialogue podcast. Before we get into this episode, please take a moment to like, subscribe, leave us a five star rating and review. If you do leave us a five star rating and review, I'll definitely read it aloud and give you a shout out on the show. It helps us go up in the rankings, helps us to reach more people and spread our message all over the world. So I'm looking forward to hearing from you all. All right. So today here with me, I have Christina Cardozo out of New Jersey. Christina, thank you so much for jumping on the show. Hi, Sam. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to share my story here. Definitely, definitely. And the interesting thing I want to share with the listeners, uh, Christina made a made a pretty dope comment on one of my posts and she was talking about where she invests at some of the creative financing strategies she plans to use in the, in the times we're in right now um, so wanted to get her on the show and and share her story so thank you again christina looking forward to unpacking everything and, and learn about your journey awesome thank you all right so give the people just a little bit of information about who you are uh what you do um yeah let's let's start there yeah sure so um I am a mom of two, um, two young boys, and I'm a math educator. So that's my full-time job. So I work in a school system. I've been working in a school system. Um, so I think I share that because as you guys probably know, educators don't make a lot of money. So I've always had to have a second job um, besides like teaching at a high school. I used to teach part-time at a college. And so always staying busy or running at a tutoring center, that kind of thing. And so my I'm part-time like a real estate investor. And when the light bulb went off, that real estate can just, you know, accelerate the process, maybe not needing a second job. That's when we started going all in with real estate. I still do work at my full-time job though. Love it. And I'm, I'm excited about digging in more because you mentioned a couple of things. So one, you're an educator. I, I work in nonprofit and educate education, all that for quite some time. And so I, I get it, right. It's not the most lucrative and what I want people to understand, what I really try to hammer into people is you don't have to be rich to invest in real estate. You know, you can have any kind of job and, and, and really be able to invest. Um, so Christina, talk to us about the beginning uh, and, and getting started in, in real estate. You mentioned the light bulb went off. We'd love to hear some more about that. Yeah, sure. So the journey started when um, my husband and I were actually looking for a place to live and we were kind of comparing rent to buying a house. And at that time, it just made more sense to buy a house. I mean, yeah, there was going to be a little bit of sacrificing and saving up some money, um, but we took advantage of the FHA loan where you only need to put down 3.5% and we we're totally fine with a little bit of a fixer upper. So that was what we were looking for. And so we began our journey looking for a property. We quickly found one, but we weren't just looking for any type of property. We were looking for a property where we could house hack. I mean, now it's called house hacking, but before it wasn't. So essentially we were looking for some type of duplex or even single family home where we can rent out a part of our home. And that's exactly what we found. We found a single family ranch home and it had a walkout basement and it was being rented out before. It had like four private rooms and so we actually converted it because it was just single. It was like rent by the room. We converted it to um, take down one of the rooms and create it a living room space. And so we had like a three bedroom apartment so we can kind of cater to small families or couples. And uh, that ended up taking care of most of our mortgage. So at that point, about 10 years ago, when we were house hacking is when I realized the power of real estate. Love it. Love it. So back back at that time, did you how did you get to the point where you knew you wanted to rent out part of the home? Is that something where did you learn that? Um, so it was just a conversation that we had, you know, yeah. and in, in our area where we are, like it's a urban type of area, it wasn't so it wasn't unheard of, you know, like a yeah. lot of families were buying duplexes so they can live on one side, like and it just made sense to us. Definitely, definitely love it. And something else you mentioned too was sacrifice, you know, saving money, which people tend to overlook, quite honestly. 
and is such an integral part of this journey if, if you're not starting with a pile of money. So can you talk about the steps that you and your husband took to prepare financially to, to yeah. buy that home? Yeah. So actually at the time, and my mom had given me this hint at the time um, because I was just starting into my career. And so I was used to not making a lot of money, even though I did it. I was making a little bit more when I started <laughs> teaching, but yeah. you know, it was more money than I was making before. So we were kind of used to living on like this lower budget. So actually it was suggested by my mom, like make sure you guys find a place where pretty much one can sustain the home. And then that started making us think, well, yeah, not only that, but if we can find a place where the majority could be taken care of by renters, right? Um, and so, yes, it was a little bit of a sacrifice, but at the same time, because I had just started working, it wasn't so hard for me to put that money aside. And I've always been pretty frugal since I was actually a kid. So it wasn't hard for me to save, um, but I knew like, long term, it's going to be worth it, right? Like I knew what we were saving for. So it was easier one, because I had practiced it before. And two, I knew that um, by doing this, I didn't really realize the power of appreciation. But I did realize that by just saving a little bit, we were going to save longer in the long term, because having this house is going to be cheaper than renting an apartment at the time. Definitely, definitely. And was that, was that, was that property in, uh, in New Jersey? Yeah. So that first property 10 years ago was in New Jersey. And then, um, we stayed in there for about five years and then we bought another property because our family was growing and we bought another property not too far away. And then we ended up renting out that house completely. So by renting out the house completely, it was not only paying for itself, but then it was paying for like half of our new mortgage. Wow. Love yeah. it. Love it. Love it. So can I just want to go back to a couple of things. So for those who may not know, can you explain what the FHA program is? Yeah. So a lot of people have this myth that, you know, you can't buy a property unless you have 20% down. And that's just not true. There is actually quite a few programs where maybe you can only put 0% down, right? At the time, um, it was, there were certain incentives. So it's something that you want to ask lenders that you want to network with people to be able to figure out like, where can I find like the 0% down? Because sometimes it might be in certain counties or certain communities that allow it. So actually at the time we had heard about it from a lender, but we weren't looking in that specific county. We were looking at another county. So we're like, well, what are our options? You want to make sure that you're speaking up and you're asking questions. And then we heard that, you know, the lowest amount down at that time was the FHA 3.5% down. So we decided to go that route. And yes, you pay a little bit of, you know, you pay a PMI. So you're paying because you didn't put down that 20%. But when I was running the numbers, I'm like, well, it's okay for me even though I will back up a little bit, um, we actually had 20% down to put, but that means if we put that money down, we wouldn't have had enough to fix up the property. Mm. So we decided that it made more sense to um, pay the PMI to pay, you know, whatever it was like $150 per month by not putting down that full 20% and still having that cash. So we could do some renovations. And that's exactly what we did. We, close on the house in May. I'll never forget. It was May 4th. We closed on the house and right away we had contractors ready to fix the downstairs area, the place that we knew where we wanted to fix up. We fixed up everything and our mortgage wasn't due until July 1st, that first payment. And by mm -hmm. ju July 1st, we already had renters. So we never actually paid for a mortgage. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. What was that experience? Can you talk about the extent of the work? that the property needed and presumably this is your first time doing like a rehab what what was that experience like for you yeah so i loved hgtv at the time <laughs> so it was a, it was a cool like real life experience um we actually had like a close friend of ours he lived really close to us too he was like just starting into like his handyman construction type of business so it was just it couldn't have been more perfect timing for us like us just getting started him getting started he was very handy very knowledgeable so um so yeah, so basically we put the money into downstairs. So we put new flooring, re 
recessed lightings. Again, we took out um, a bedroom to make it a living room space. We put new a new bathroom. So we were making this place look super nice. And that was the priority. And actually upstairs, so that was a walkout basement, upstairs where we were staying, it was still like outdated. And I actually mm-hmm. had friends come to me and say like, wow, you're living in this space, downstairs looks nicer. And again, that's part of that delay gratification. You know, I, we had, we were thinking of the future. Well, the people downstairs, we want to live in a nice space because they're going to be taking care of the majority of our mortgage. Once we get that taken care of, then we'll be working. We'll kind of like rebuild our savings again. Right. And then now we don't have to worry about a mortgage. So as we're saving up more money, then we can fix up the upstairs portion of our house. So again, that was actually because we had, um, we had closed on the property in May and then July mm-hmm. 1st, we had it rented at everything. And then in the summertime, I'm off as a teacher. So sure. I started working upstairs. So I was doing things myself. So I was painting the house, the whole interior myself. I uh, renovated the kitchen. So I was going to like warehouses to check out the new cabinets, warehouses to check out the granite slabs. So I was trying to like, not cut corners, but I was just trying to save as much as I could by not going that general contract away. And I was learning that process as well. Love it. Love it. Love it. So you two were living in the basement? No, we were living on the main floor. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So one thing you mentioned that I really want to make sure to talk a bit more about is that you, you were doing a lot, a lot of the work yourself. And oftentimes people for various reasons, they just outsource all the work. And as a result, they don't really know what's going on. They don't know if something's being done correctly. They don't know if something is being done incorrectly. They don't know if they're paying too much for materials or whatever the case may be. What were some of the advantages you would say of getting your hands in there and doing some of the work? Yeah. So, I mean, I started off by like getting some quotes, like finding out like what the price is for certain things. And then when I realized like, oh, somebody's going to charge me $2,000, I could do that myself. Right. (laughs) (laughs) So especially because our friend was a handyman and he would kind of give me tips how to do this, you know, and I was always paying attention. I'm like, I want to learn how to put down tiles. Not to say that I can really do that, but I'm like watching him and I'm asking him questions while he's doing that. And so I... Um, was really able to learn. So every time, you know, a handyman would come in, I would ask questions and I would just really watch them and study and see what they're doing to see if that's something that I could replicate later in the future or if I can do something similar. Definitely. Love that. Love that. I think I think it's very valuable to be able to, to learn some of those things because in the future, when you do delegate or do different things, like you actually, actually you have a, a foundation, right? where you, you know a baseline level of stuff at, at the very least, instead of knowing nothing and just blindly yeah. sending I money. I mean, even when it comes to painting, right? I think most people can paint. People, you just have to be patient, right? But most people, it's not like a hard skill to do. But yet that is one of the most expensive jobs that you will encounter while you're like fixing up a place, right? So that was always like, my job, like I'll take care of the interior painting. I'll take care of, you know, like trim work and doing all that stuff because I, maybe if it's in the summer, I have more time or I'd make the time for it because I knew that it could save me some money. Definitely. Definitely. So what was your experience like screening a tenant for the first time? How did, how did it go with them? Were they, was it good? Did they have to, did you have to move on? Uh, So our first tenant, So I think we had like listed it on Facebook or, and it just started getting shared by a lot of people. And then I felt like a a realtor because then I had like a line of people or like this long list of people who wanted to stay in the place. Cause again, we made it look really nice. And so um, then we decided on this one couple that had a child and it really, I think at that time we agreed to like a six month because it was like the first time us trying this out and we didn't want to do a year lease and he didn't end up renewing the lease. He ends up finding something else. Um, and then after that, I think we pretty much either had like family or friends that ended up staying because we had so many people at the same, at that same time, I think we were like 24, 25 years old. So there was a lot of our friends that are ready to like get out their parents' house or to move to a different place. And so that was pretty cool too, to be able to like rent to, to them as well. Yeah. Yeah. So 
there some people like renting to families and friends some people don't what 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 was your experience like honestly it wasn't bad at all because they had their own space and again we had like a big enough backyard that we could all chill in the same space but we never had an issue with renting to family or friends good good i love it love it love it so you you mentioned you moved move, you end up moving to, to another home with, with your family as a family grew and you end up renting out that entire the entire home the upstairs and downstairs which covered itself and then also paid for your paid for part of some of the mortgage at the new house and i'll also know you eventually start investing out of state uh, so where so you're in you're in the new house family's growing exciting times where does real estate go from there Okay. So after that time, not too long after our tenants were actually renting out the whole house, they decided, they asked us if they could buy the house from us. So that was an easy transaction, right? We didn't have to deal with realtors and we sold them the house. And at the time we're like, wow, that's when we learned of the power of appreciation. Mind you, if we would have kept the house now, it would have been like even more because <laughs> yeah. we sold in like 2017. So yeah, <laughs> even though like it was good, after, roughly. yeah, yeah. So even though it was a good amount of money coming back to us, now I realize like the game plan is to just buy and hold. At least that's, you know, my game plan. So anyways, um, what we did with that money, because it seemed like a lot of money for us when we sold that property, then we're like, all right, we feel comfortable flipping because we had dealt with a fixer upper. Um, we saw the power of appreciation. We know the power of flipping. And then we started like networking, connecting and did a few flips. And to be honest, they didn't really go that well. Um, one, we lost money. The other one barely make, made money after a year. And that was partnering up with a few other people. And so the lesson learned with those flips was that this is like another job. And so like, is it worth it in the end? I mean, I'm sure like people, they can dedicate it, but for us at the time being two full-time jobs, mm -hmm. you know, we also have two very young kids. Like I just had a, my second baby at the time. And so we just realized like, this is not where we want to go. We were happy being landlords. So then we decided to start looking around again, that first property had amazing cash flow. So like in my mind, I was like, I just need to find one of these again. Right. Sounds simple, but it was not like the times are just different. I couldn't, I couldn't find anything that was going to cash flow $1,200, you know, pay for all expenses and then cash flow $1,200 at the time. And so we actually looked for over a year, like anywhere central New Jersey, we were looking. And then we realized that, you know, we started running numbers. I think we had went on like a vacation in the Poconos area and we realized mm -hmm. like, you know, we see some houses for sale. I do some numbers real quick. I'm like, the house is this cheap and you can rent for this amount of money per night, right? So that's when it started clicking. Like, I think there are other options than just looking in New Jersey, somewhere that's close to us. And so that's when we started venturing out and really started studying outside markets. We looked in Florida. At the time we were putting offers in and they were just, um, they were just getting outbid. And then I really had my eye out on Poconos for a while. And so then we decided to go that route and we bought a property in the Poconos, but specifically because we we're looking for cash flow, we decided to go with the short-term rental. And also because we love vacationing, exploring ourselves with kids. So it just seemed like the perfect route for us. So that was the beginning of like out-of-state investing. Love it. Love it. And were were you renting out on on Airbnb or a different kind of platform? What, when how many years was that? Like a few years ago. So yeah, that was last year already. Oh, cool, cool. Um, yeah. <laughs> so starting in twenty twenty one, um, we were renting out on Airbnb. It, it was so busy on Airbnb, honestly. Like I didn't even have to like list on anything else. Wow, wow. So so break break that break that down to us. So you're coming from long-term rentals and now you're jumping into short-term rentals which which is a bit different what what was it like man what is it like managing it like did you have systems in the beginning was it kind of figuring it out along the way 
what, what was that transition like for you? And also yeah. you're not there. Right, right. So with the long-term rental, sometimes you, it, it's very rare that you'll get a call, like you have to fix the toilet or something, you know, broke. It, it's very, it's not very common. Um, and if you're thinking like, well, what's the cash flow compared to that, right? And then you think about short-term rentals, there is high turnover. There's a lot more work, but then the cash flow ideally should be at least to me, it should be at least three times as much than what a long-term rental would give you. So um, again, like, because we're looking for cash flow, I'm like, I'm totally fine with managing this. And so for the Poconos, it was only a two hour drive for us. So we did do a lot of things ourselves and we did drive out there every weekend for three months um, with their kids. <laughs> so yeah. that was a sacrifice, right? Getting it ready again, I'm painting the house, right? So there's a lot of things that we're like trying to save money, trying to get it started, Um but I will also back up a little bit because I forgot to mention that we also have an RV that we rent. So, and that we bought in 2020. So that kind of gave us a taste of like what it's like to rent out short term. So people yeah. rent out our class A RV. It's like a bus that sleeps 10 people. And so they'll rent out for like four nights a week, 10 days, um, really all throughout the year. And so I have I already had that experience of like that hospitality and like, you know, getting things ready for people. So this made it a little bit easier because I really just need my handyman and my cleaner. My cleaner is really like my eyes on the property. So if I have like these solid people on my team, then I feel comfortable being far away. And then again, it's like a lot less work than dealing with an RV that I'm having to flip myself. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Let's talk about the the RV real quick. I, I've actually yeah. never heard of, well, I guess I don't even know if I've been inside of an RV, but I didn't okay. even realize people are like using them. Like I didn't realize people rent them out. I just assume maybe like other people, like you just buy it and you like to travel and with your family, whatever the case may be. But I didn't know people rent them out. So how did you think of that? And what, walk us through that. That's, that's pretty, it's pretty cool. Yeah. So it all started because I have been dying to like rent out an RV. So I've been wanting to go out like an RV vacation. And yeah. in, in 2020, I, you know, got a group of friends. I'm like, and my kids, my family, and we're like, we're going to go out, we're going to rent out this RV. And then what ended up happening in 2020, everything got canceled, right? Everything, you know, it, you know how it was. <laughs> and so I was really upset. And I was like, man, I'm still itching to go out on this RV. So a few months later go by and things are starting to calm down a little bit. And so um, we're just kind of Googling because I was familiar with certain sites. So just like there's Airbnb or VRBO where you can rent out your house and like there's sites where you can rent out your car like Toro, right? So there's sites where you can rent out your RV. So one of them is called RV Share. It's an app. So when you look on RV Share, you'll be able to see, you know, a list of different RVs and where they are. You can get them different sizes, different sleeping capacities and so forth and all their features. So I decided like, let's plan a vacation to go somewhere close by on the East Coast, um, just from like Jersey to Virginia. And it was such a cool experience, but the guy who we rented from, he actually owned this RV business where he had four RVs and then he was managing four other RVs. So he had eight RVs on his property. So wow. at that point, again, starting to like the light bulb starting to go off, start running the numbers like, oh, if we buy an RV and we can rent this out per night and so forth. So that's where like that whole process started and we decided to give it a go. And it's honestly, it cash flows more than our short-term rentals. Wow, that's incredible. I'm picking <laughs> up on something you're finding ways to make money doing things you enjoy from yes, things you enjoy. Yes. So you mentioned like you enjoy traveling, right? Yeah. Poconos, you know, I'm from the tri-state area. So I, you know, very familiar with Poconos, everyone's been. And so you discovered, Hey, maybe we can rent, we can buy a property that we can obviously use when we want to go there and rent it out when we're not there. And similarly with the RV and discovering the person rented from has like a whole business they're running through it. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I'm, that I'm picking up, which I think is pretty dope. And the idea with the RV wasn't that we were really planning to cash flow so much. The idea was 
And this actually came from the owner himself. He was like, you know, you can have a free RV. And we're like, what do you mean? He was like, yeah, when you're, you're, let's say you're financing an RV for $550, $600 per month, but yet you can charge $300, $400 per night, right? Um, He was like, within a three-year period, it will pay off itself completely. And then you just have a free RV. So not only can you use it throughout the three-year periods, whenever you want, you can block off your calendar, but then at the end of the three years, you know, you just have a paid off RV. If you want to turn around and sell it back to the dealer, or you want to upgrade it for a newer one or whatever you want to do. Um, so that's what, that's what got us started. Cause a lot of people will look at the RV like, oh, that's a depreciating asset. To be honest, we can actually sell it for more than what we bought it for, but that's because we bought it in 2020. Um, So it depends on the time. But, you know, sometimes, and I think this comes from like, because I'm an educator, because I always had to be like frugal, because I had to always have a second job. Sometimes you start thinking differently, right? Like, and I feel like with our young people nowadays, like that's exactly what they have to do when you know, and this, I could go a whole nother route, but like the way like colleges and universities are so expensive now, you know, um, depending on what you want to study, maybe you might want to be thinking about like, what are other alternatives for me to make money? Definitely, definitely. And no, I agree. I, I definitely agree with that. I mean, the cost of college is ridiculous these days. You know, there was a day long before our time where you could work through college pretty much wherever and pay for your school, but that's nearly impossible now. The student loan is, yeah, that's like a whole nother episode. <laughs> but I, I think I think we're in line on that. <laughs> awesome. So for the RV, um, this is fascinating to me. Is there, <laughs> so I know like, let's say you're renting out a car or whatever the case may be, there's um, limits or maybe mileage or something like that. How does that work? Like, can somebody take your car from wherever it's based at you can go to Florida. Is that allowable? Like what, what, yeah. what are the, what are the parameters and, and how does that work? They can go anywhere. Sometimes we get requests for a whole month. People want to take out the RV. So people want to go cross country, you know, a lot of people still don't feel comfortable maybe traveling in the plane, or they just want to have like a different experience and they want to, you know, explore areas on the way. So we get a lot of people that usually will want to take it for two weeks to a month. They'll travel to California or most people are like traveling because I'm on the East coast. Most people are traveling like maybe to Michigan or maybe to Florida, like somewhere in that region. Got it. Got it. Is it pretty, is it kind of hands off for you? Or like when, when they come back, do you have someone cleaning or do you can, do you guys go and flip it yourself real quick before it goes out to the next person? Yeah. So there's a way to like block out the calendar for a few days. So when we do get it back, we make sure that we do have like two days in between. Um, Somebody who has this like as a full-time business, yeah, they'd probably be able to flip it pretty quickly, but because we're busy, uh, we want to make sure that we have some space in between. Um, So yes, I have somebody that cleans the RV. In the beginning, I didn't, I was doing it myself. And then, you know, I'm starting to think like business-wise, no, I need to have certain people in place. Um, even in the beginning, what I used to do is I was giving them a tour of the RV. So I was saying, this is how this works. This is how the bed drops down and so forth. And then I'm realizing that's taking almost an hour of my time to walk through the whole RV with them. So that I start thinking smarter. So we actually found like some YouTube videos that show the same type of RV that we have and does like the whole tour and explains the outside, how to hook up like this you know, like the septic, that kind of thing. And so I send out those videos in an email ahead of time. So make sure that they watch it. So when they're coming to pick it up, maybe it's a quick 15 minutes. So learning throughout the process, um, but it is a little bit more hands-on than like a property, right? Um, Mm -hmm. But once you have your systems in place, it becomes a lot easier. Love it, love it. And, you know, people are living in it. So to me, it's, a different kind of real estate. It just so happens to have wheels on and you can drive it. <laughs> yeah. It's a home on wheels. <laughs> <laughs> that's so dope. That's so like, I've never spoken to anybody who who's has that kind of business. So I think that's, that's really cool. And I'm sure everyone got a whole lot of value out of, out of that segment. So I appreciate you <laughs> deep diving into that. Of course. 
So I know uh, you also invest in Wisconsin and Missouri, which is like way out from the East yes. Coast. So yes. talk to me about the transition to the Midwest. So, you, you know, you're in Jersey, then you go to Pennsylvania and then boom, Midwest. So talk, <laughs> talk to us about that transition. I was looking at some of the pictures of the properties on Instagram too. So looking forward to hearing about that. Sure. So yeah, once we got the Pocono property ready, we felt comfortable, like we can do this. If we can do this two hours away, then you know what it, it's going to do? It's going to force us to have certain systems in place. It's going to force me to not go and paint the house, right? Like we're going to manage this like a business. And so honestly, we started looking for like unique types of properties. And I think that's what keeps us busy all year long because we're not just one more type of house. You know, we specifically look for, um, different unique types of properties. So we have an A-frame in Wisconsin. So the A-frame, you know, looks like a triangle, some people say, and it's nine blocks away from one of the largest lakes in Wisconsin. And it's also about 20 minutes outside of 20, 25 minutes outside of Wisconsin Dells, which is a place that like a lot of people in that area, they all go to. There's amusement parks. Um, it's like a family type of place. And so we are, we're still going to places that people want to travel to, but like a little bit on the outskirts, right? So it's pretty rural. Um, what attracted us to it was the house because it was a unique property. And uh, so you know, we're just like looking around, looking on Zillow or Realtor. And then when the house kind of speaks to us, we're not scared to like venture out. And so we got close on that property in Wisconsin. And then we found another A-frame in Missouri. And so we went to close on that. We closed on that property. And then unfortunately, while all this is going around and we're like, yes, we're able to like, you know, kind of scale, we kind of figured out this formula and so forth. And we're letting the cash flow of some of our properties pay for the other expenses and so forth. Um, we got news that the HOA where our Pocono property is, they're trying to ban short-term rentals. So they're kind of like doing everything in their power because it's an HOA, it's a gated community that that's what they want to do. And they said they were going to vote on it and so forth. And at that time, we're like, we're not playing around, we're out of here. So we listed our house as soon as we found out, like this is the direction that they were going to go to, because honestly, we just didn't feel like this trust. And so we sold that property and then we ended up doing a 1031 exchange. Can you explain what that is? Sure. So for those of you who don't know, when you have a property for less than a year, or even if you have a property for more than that, you can get hit with um, capital gains. And so we were going to get hit with short-term capital gains. And so in order to avoid paying these high taxes, we decided to do what's called a 1031 exchange, which means like you kind of have this middle person who's actually an attorney, he's holding on to your funds from when you sell that one property, he's holding on to your funds. And then when you find a new property, he's going to literally move that money, your profit into the next property. Now, the only thing with the 1031 exchanges is you have to find a new location within 45 days. And so when it came down to like, wow, like how are we going to find another property when it, within 45 days? Do we really want to go to another market? You know, we've been to Pennsylvania, we've been to Wisconsin, we're already in Missouri. Do we want to find another new location? And honestly, I had actually, um, I had saved this property on Zillow when I saw it come out. And then, you know, you get like alerts when the price drops down. Mm -hmm. So the price dropped down by like $25,000, $30,000. And Whoa. so when I got that alert, I was like, whoa, this, and it's a new construction too. And it was 10 minutes away from our A-frame in Missouri. So I was like, hmm, like call up zoning real quick. Like, <laughs> can I have short term <laughs> rentals here? And they assured that it was okay. And so, um, yeah, I, I, and we also have like a really great team in Missouri. Like I, I'm so grateful for these people. And so if there was any other location that I could do with 1031, I was so confident in just picking that Missouri location. And so um, it was actually within the 45 day period, we told them that this is the new location and then we closed on that property. So we have two in Missouri. 
Love it, love it. So two in Missouri, then the one, one the A-frame in Wisconsin, right? Yes. Awesome. What is an A-frame? Because I, oh. I I saw the picture, but what? Let, let the people know so, what an A-frame is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so A-frame, so the tiny house in Missouri is an A-frame, but it has a loft. And a lot of the A-frames do have loft area. So it looks like this triangle from the outside. So the roof is just slanted like a triangle. Mm -hmm. um, and they're just to me, they're just beautiful. They're unique. If you actually go on Airbnb app, there are different uh, categories of different types of properties. You know, do you want a tiny house? Do you want an A-frame? Do you want like something different? So people specifically look for these types of homes. And so that's also what attracted us to these types of homes. So the A-frame we have in Wisconsin is a little bit larger. It's like a three bedroom, two bathroom. Um, it doesn't have a loft. It does still have that whole second floor. Um, but the peak of the house is actually in the, like the bathroom is in the peak. So then like, it's like a little awkward because you have a tub <laughs> there, <laughs> but still they're a little like quirky in, in yeah. the shape, but again, they're different and people like to have these different unique experiences. Definitely love that. I love that. So when, so when did you get the, the first Wisconsin property and then the Missouri one, the first Missouri one? Yeah. So they were kind of like back to back in the beginning of this year. So Got in so February. You, uh huh. So y'all been on the run the last year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's been busy. Got you. Got you. So in the, the most recent Missouri home, was that this year or was that last year? So the most recent one, that was because of the 1031 exchange. Oh, that yeah, one yeah. was, yeah, that one was this year. And Got that it. one was fun. That was a story in itself because um, we sold the Pocono property and I love my, the Pocono house. I love like design and all that stuff. That's another thing that I do too. Um, but after mm -hmm. designing that property, the people who are buying it, they said they just wanted the beds. They didn't want any decor or like all this extra stuff that we had. So then we brought it to our house. Uh, we didn't even keep it in storage. We're like, well, I guess we can keep it in our house right now, our downstairs level. And then the idea came about like, well, since it was summertime and we were just closing on this new Missouri house, how about I go drive out to Missouri with all this furniture from the Pocono house? So I did that. My mom came along with me and my two kids because it was summer break for me. And so I went to Missouri, drove there. It was about 18 hours and um, we got a whole house ready. My mom was able to help me out too. Even my nine-year-old son was involved and we assembled all the furniture, got it ready within like less than a week. Wow. Did you, did you take the RV? No. <laughs> <laughs> No, I didn't take the RV. Honestly, that probably would have taken like double the time if I drove really? out an RV. Just because like, I don't feel that there's so like so many curves and so many uh, roads. Like, yeah, and then I would, yeah. you know, like when you're in an mm -hmm. RV, you're trying to like be relaxed. But for me, it was like, I got to get there. I got a time yeah. limit, you know? <laughs> that makes sense. What part of Missouri is it in? Are, are, are you are familiar with parts? Branson, Missouri? No, no. No. Okay. So Branson, Missouri actually gets about 10 million people that visit every year. And it's actually known as the entertainment capital of the world. And wow. um, to me, it's not just about like what attracts, it's also like the natural beauty of the place. So there's so many mountains, there's the lakes. Um, I'm sure you heard of the Ozarks. So that's where it's located. That's where the Ozark mountains are. And so you just have like this beautiful scene everywhere. You have the water, they have great weather. Like it's just, it's awesome. And then it's also like a great family place. So they have so many amusement parks. They have so many shows because like New York is known for like Broadway and their shows, right? Well, there's nothing in the Midwest, but they have Branson for that. So you oh. have like all these artists and singers and actors and like all the shows are actually taking place in Branson, Missouri. Wow, that's pretty dope. You know your market. It's important to do that market research. There's a lesson for you. Absolutely. For <laughs> yes. That's awesome. That's awesome. Oh, so both the Missouri properties are in Branson? So they're right outside of Branson. Oh, yes. sorry, right outside of Branson. Okay, cool, cool. Yes. And then you mentioned the one in Wisconsin is also in like a touristy kind of area too, right? It's right outside of a touristy area. Yeah. Right so outside. you'll notice like 
our theme is that we're not like in the middle of this like busy area, right? Because one, prices are a lot more expensive when you're in that city. Two is there's also more when it comes to regulations, there's more short-term rental regulations when you're like right there in the middle of the city, or there's a lot of maybe condos or houses on top of each other, right? But when you're going on the outskirts of it, people are willing to pay, you know, a good, you know, a decent amount of money. They're willing to pay for a property that's not only unique, but that maybe has more space, right? Like it's, it's not, there's a lot of condos in Branson, Missouri. And so we specifically didn't want to get a condo. Um, so in both properties, there's land there. So people will travel there just, you know, if they have a big family for, our, we have a large property and then we have a tiny house, both in Missouri. So people will go to both locations just for like that privacy, but still they're only either 10 minutes away or a 20 minute drive from Branson, Missouri. I love it. I love it. There's a lesson in there. There's a lesson in there. A lot of people feel like they have to be in the epicenter of everything. However, there could be a whole lot of opportunities just outside. You know, if you think if you think about it, a lot of us or people we know, sometimes maybe you lived in a central area and maybe your parents or maybe you yourself as an adult, you move a little bit outside for better prices. The same could apply for, for short or long-term rentals too. Yeah, I think you know, what we've learned is we really have to, especially in a market that could be saturated, you always want to either stand out or you want to do something different, right? Like if everybody's flocking to like a certain area of the Poconos, okay. In one way it's good because you know, a lot of people are traveling there, but at the same time, like if your property is not standing out, if it's not unique, if it's just another home, like it's not going to get booked. Right. And so these other markets, they're known in their space, but I would say like most people on the East coast, they don't know about Branson, Missouri, you know, but a lot of people in that region, they know, like I said, 10 million people are visiting. Um, so um, and actually when we went to the Wisconsin property and people found out we were from Jersey, they're like, how did you hear about us? You know, like, how do you guys know that this is a vacation spot that we all go to, you know? So sometimes, you know, you just have to be open to just taking a risk and exploring something different. Absolutely. Absolutely. What are your thoughts on the Airbnb, different cities around the country and the Airbnb regulations and things like that? What's, what's your opinion on that? Yeah. So, um, I agree that sometimes Airbnb can take over and it can be a problem for people who are just like everyday people that are just trying to find or buy a house for the first time, or they're just trying to, you know, rent a place and they're all getting taken away from Airbnb. Um, what I'm not okay with though, I feel like the towns just have to like set regulations you know, like you can do it in this area, you cannot do it in this area and so forth. What I'm not okay with is when certain towns or cities say, that's it, we're done. There's no people being grandfathered in. So that's that's my issue. You know, I just wish like some places would just kind of come up with those regulations and, and that's it. And just because what I've also seen in that community that we were at in the Poconos, they told us that they're trying to ban short-term rentals, that they were going to change some rules. It was going to be voted on, blah, blah, blah. And at this meeting, people were standing up and they were like, I put my whole life savings into this house. Like, I can't just now try to sell it when everybody else is trying to sell their house, you know? Mm. And now there's hundreds of houses in that area for sale and it's just sitting on the market. You know, yeah. and what the new rule is starting in 2023 of January is that they're only going to allow 10 rentals per year. 10 rentals per year is not going to, it might not even cover, I don't even think it's going to cover your mortgage, your payments, depending on when you bought, especially because a lot of people were buying at the peak of the market, right? And so I just think it's really unfair how like certain board members, certain HOAs, certain communities, certain cities are just like making these tragic things like, all right, that's it. You're cutting, you're, we're cutting off Airbnbs and you're not being grandfathered in. So I ha I do have a problem with that. Um, I heard that there's like a lot of lawsuits going on in Atlanta, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because of similar situations. So I just am not okay with that because I think people are really just 
they did hear about this, you know, and they are just trying to jump on the bandwagon because they do want to make a difference because they do want to have that side business and they do want to invest and grow and they see other people or bigger institutions do it. Right. But it's when like that regular everyday person does it, then it's like, well, now the rates are going up or now you're not allowed to do it. Right. So, you know, you kind of have to just, what I do is I just keep like networking with people. I just keep exploring different areas because I know that there's a lot of places that are still allowed or they're set. But again, I'm not specifically going into those like completely saturated markets. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that's what makes it safer for me. Definitely. Definitely. That makes sense. And you you mentioned something that I don't think, I don't think I, I, I ever thought about. You mentioned how in the Poconos, now you have these hundred something homes for sale that are just sitting on the market. What's interesting about that to me is they probably thought someone would buy them because someone would buy them because maybe they think your folks like investors are getting in the way of people, people being able to buy the homes. But if they're sitting on the market, are they? Are our investors getting in the way? Right. So now people don't want to buy in that community because they know that that they can't rent it out as a short term rental. So just as of, you know, maybe last year, I could say was the peak, you know, houses were being sold for really high. And so that's when people were buying. And then now you got all these houses sitting and they don't want to be and people don't want to buy in, you know, so it becomes a problem. I mean, even for the community, the community was making money by having these renters come in here. So I don't know if they were even thinking about all this, the consequences. Yeah. I mean, especially in a place where people travel a lot too, the business of the restaurants, everywhere. I mean, absolutely. I mean, even in the community, because in that community, there were long-term rentals. In that community, I had my snowplow guy, you know, I had um, uh, a cleaner there. And so we were also giving them jobs. There was business opportunities for them, people who lived in that community. So now they're struggling because all these people are trying to get out and it's also affecting the long-term, you know, the people who live there, it's affecting them traumatically with their business. Yeah. And I don't know if these cities, HOA, municipalities, whatever you want to call them, I don't know if they're thinking about all those things. Right. I don't think so. Yeah. Very, very crazy. Very crazy. So what, what, what does the future look like? I mean, y'all have been killing it the last, the last year or so. <laughs> where's, where's the next state? Or do you want to buy more in, in some of the areas you're investing in now? What, what are some things you want to do? Yeah. So we're currently looking at other states right now. (laughs) So I've been actually talking to zoning in other regions. Um, I think for me, because I had mentioned like on that post about like, you know, maybe doing seller's financing, like that's a, that's an option. Um, But also like the biggest difference is when you are buying a property that's very expensive, or let's say more than 300,000, 400,000, 500,000, you are feeling that interest rate, you know, like going from three, 4% to going to 7%, you are really feeling that difference, right? It's hundreds of dollars that of difference. And so it's really cutting into your profit. So now it's a matter of like going a creative way, or you can look for a cheaper property because if your property is cheaper, let's say under a hundred thousand or $150,000, right? And a lot of times you still can find these out of state, right? Um, if you're in an expensive type of area, like I am in New Jersey or you are in California, right? Um, if you're going out different areas, then if it's a 7% interest rate, or if it's a three and a half or 4% interest rate, the difference might only be less than a hundred dollars or a hundred dollars at most. And so that's kind of the route that I'm going right now. Like, what can I get? And then also what I've experienced, and you don't know this until you're either talking to somebody who's done this or you've done this yourself. But now that we have different size properties, I'm realizing that our cash on cash return on investment is extremely much higher in the tiny house than it is in any other location. Why is that? Because couples, if it's, you know, a couple or if it's a mom and child, or if it's just a single person, they're always traveling. So we're getting like high occupancy rate. And so our house is like always being 
looked is always being occupied. Whereas in those other houses, yeah, it's paying for itself. Yeah, it's giving us cash flow, but it's really just being used on the weekends or maybe like a three day weekend, right? And so I'm looking at like, well, what can I get? Like, I'm always looking for like that highest cash on cash return on investment, mm -hmm. right? And so if I had, let's say $100,000, but if I can put them into like smaller homes, instead of like just one bigger home, that's where that's, that's my goal right now is to do like small homes, um, instead of buying like one larger home. Definitely. Can you explain what cash on cash return is? Yeah, absolutely. So when I'm actually doing the numbers that includes figuring out one, like how much do I, <clears throat> sorry, how much do I think that I can actually cash flow by the end of the year? And there's so much research, there's so much legwork behind that. So there's certain like data websites that I look at. So I'll share one of them with you. One of them is called AirDNA. Are you familiar with AirDNA? Yeah, we had one guest in the short term talk about AirDNA, but let's let's talk about it again. Okay. So AirDNA is a great website. I just like use the free version of it, but AirDNA, um, you put in the town that you're interested in. Like, let's say you want to have a, a short-term rental. So you would put in that town and then you get an idea of like the occupancy rate. You get an idea of how many rentals are already there in that city. You get an idea of like how much you're going to gross and so forth. So once you have that number, um, so let's say you can gross approximately $50,000 per year. Well, that's not that there's a difference between gross and net, right? So then you want to think about, well, if you bought a specific property, how much are the expenses going to be and so forth. So uh, I'm going to get out a spreadsheet or at this point, I'm kind of like, I kind of already have an idea of like how much my expenses are going to be in terms of like, um, my mortgage payment, taxes, and so forth. And then with short-term rentals, you also have to think about other expenses like lawn care and you know electricity and internet and so forth. And so basically when I'm figuring out my cash on cash return on investment, I'm thinking about how much money do I need to bring to the table, right? And I'm always looking for the least amount of money possible. So when you're getting into these second homes, you can buy multiple second homes all over the country with a second home loan. And with the second home loan, you only need to put down 10%. So if I can put down 10%, sometimes you can even include, especially now going into a buyer's market, you can include like closing costs could be like all incorporated, right? So I'm trying to put like the least amount of money down for this property. And then I'm going to divide that by the total number of like what my net is going to be, right? So how much do I think I'm going to cash flow and so forth? Um, so once I do that, like I'm specifically looking for properties. And again, this is this is um, an estimated guess and I'm always trying to be more conservative, but ideally mm -hmm. I look at properties that are ideally going to cash flow at least 30%, somewhere around that range. Um, because there is a lot of work when it comes to Airbnb or VRBO, right? Like there's constant communication between the cleaner. Um, they send me pictures every time that they're cleaning the property. So I have an idea of what it looks like before the new guest is coming in. Um, I have such strong relationships with them, like great relationships that they're so comfortable with like, They'll tell me like the soap was low, the s'mores was low because I provide s'mores for some of my properties. Um, nice. And so they'll go pick it up and they said, we happen to already pick it up because we already knew you were low. We included the invoice like, and that's great because you don't need to contact me saying like, you know, can we buy this? It's $5, right? Like, I trust you. You're my eyes on the property. You already send me pictures. Um, so yeah, that's, <laughs> there's a lot of Love things it. there. Love it. Love it. I was, you kind of got into the next question I was going to ask, how have you built your team out of state? So, so in Wisconsin, in Missouri, I mean, you're in Jersey, so, I, you know, you're not flying back and forth every weekend to check on right. things. So how, how are you delegating and getting things done through other people? Yeah. So great question. So when it came to our Wisconsin property, it's not always easy, but when it came to our <clears throat> well, I'll back up to our Poconos. What we learned with our Poconos after the day we closed, I started 
contacting people using social media. Honestly, I use, and I always tell people, if there's a certain area that you want to know about, join a Facebook group in that area. You know, if you want to buy a property in Wisconsin, join a Wisconsin real estate group or anything. Like I'm, I joined a moms in Wisconsin group, you know, like just because I'm (laughs) trying, you know, I, I feel like you can get a lot of insight when you're joining these groups. And so I met, I connected with a realtor and I asked her at first, like, tell me a handyman that you bring to your own house. Who would you recommend? Like, those are my kind of questions once I connected with the realtor. And then when that person tells me, then um, I will show that person like, you know, the scope of everything that I want done. But I was mentioning with the Pocono properties, I learned that after I closed on that property, I then was calling contractors. Um, and then meeting with contractors. And then you have to wait for them to give you a quote and so forth. Like that process alone took weeks. And honestly, it was a waste of time. Now I've Mm. learned to create my team before I close on the property. So that was my lesson learned. So now um, I do have teams in separate places, but I learned really just through networking on like Facebook groups or asking my realtor, like, who would you recommend? Um, And sometimes you have to try out different people, but that's really just how I built my teams, like just word of mouth, like, who would you recommend for this? Who would you recommend for that? And um, Missouri team is definitely like my solid team. Like I have my realtor, my lender, my photographer, my clean, I have multiple cleaners there, like backup cleaners, um, handyman, plumbers, like everything listed. (laughs) Um, So yeah, it's just, it's, it makes it so much easier when you build that team. And then it's easier to also scale because you know, you have like these trustworthy people. And then if you can go out there and visit. And so with the tiny house, I had people like working on it and I had never physically met, you know, we were just Mm -hmm. FaceTiming. But when I went out that second time we bought the property, I made sure I met with all of them because we had already been doing business for like at least six months. Right. And so I met with them. And so now we have this more of a real connection. Definitely. Definitely. I love that. I love that. And I'm really glad you mentioned that because a lot of people who live in expensive markets are afraid of investing out of state. And of course, there's challenges with everything, right? It's just life and just investing. And if you build your team properly, if you delegate properly over time, you'll get better and get better. And you won't have to wake up in the middle of the night wondering what's going on because your team has it under control. So I'm glad you really broke down specifically, you know, how you've built it, who you have on the team and, and, and those things. So I really appreciate that. Of course. Definitely, definitely. Wow. So this has been such a great interview, Christina, just hearing about, I I just keep thinking about the beginning when you and your husband purchased that first property and, you know, you were painting and, and, you know, rehabbing the the prop, the the place and and getting it up to what you would like house hacking. And you've grown tremendously from there in the last year and a half, y'all have been on a run and obviously a lot of lessons learned in between that. And, Something else I keep thinking about as well is, is, you know, you're very agile. You two seem to be very agile and just, you know, finding your niche as well. You mentioned places that people travel to and being a little bit outside of there. And you mentioned two places, two particular locations I never heard of. And millions and millions and millions of people are visiting there. So I think kudos to you as well for finding, finding those places where, you know, may not be the headline, but, you know, I'm sure you're not unhappy with, with the profits from that. So, you know, I think it's definitely been a super jam-packed interview. Thank you. I will add on to that. Um, another piece of the puzzle that we use is like, it's called drivable destinations. So mm. nobody's flying into the Poconos. Nobody's really flying into Branson, Missouri, but like they're all drivable locations. Like if you remember your, when you lived here on the East coast, of course you heard of Poconos because some people were driving out there on the weekend as if it was for the winter and going skiing. Right. So everybody in the local area knows about the Poconos, but maybe people out in California, they don't. Right. Because again, people are not flying out there. So yeah, you have to think about, sometimes there could be places that are much closer to you think about like these drivable destinations and see if it's worth it to invest there, especially if you're in an expensive area like I am. Mic drop. Mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> 
There you have it. Christina, what, anything else you want to leave with the people, any advice you have for someone who aspires to uh, do what you're doing, get into short-term rentals, whether it be local, whether it be out of state, any additional advice that you may not have shared that you want to leave them with? So I always say like, if you can connect or you can network with people who are where you want to be, that's going to be ideal, right? So, you know, pick people's brains. If you want to connect with me, that's totally fine. Um, I love educating people in this space. And I think that you really have to, yes, there is some work involved, but if you are willing to put that work up front, it's going to be so worth it. You know, um, it's just a little bit of work up front in terms of educating yourself and networking with people, connecting with people, and you will be surprised, like do that for a year and, you know, things will be completely different uh, one year later. Definitely, definitely. And can you appreciate that? Can you, Christina, let people know where, to, where they can find you, maybe any resources you may have that can be beneficial to any of the listeners? Can you share some of those things too? Yeah, sure. So I, I'm mostly on Instagram right now. So you can find me at She Runs the Numbers. Sometimes I'll talk about like the real estate journey. I'll talk about some personal finance tips. Sometimes I talk about what it's like being a mom and what I'm doing, you know, in order to teach my own kids personal finance and being financially literate. So yeah, you can connect with me there. Um, because I am an educator at heart, I actually created like a parent and me course in order to make sure that the parent and the child are learning financial literacy together. Um, I realized that my own son, who was actually, I think seven or eight at the time, now he's nine, but I was listening to him <clears throat> talk to like family and friends about real estate and, and buying stocks and so forth. And then I realized like, wow, he's picking this all up, not because I'm lecturing him, but, but just because I'm like open with talking about these kind of conversations and money and so forth. And that's my goal is to like inspire like other parents and families to do that as well. Definitely, definitely love it. Love it. Well, Christina, thank you so much for getting on the show. I'm looking forward to putting this one out and, and sharing your story. Thank you so much for having me. No problem, no problem. And thank you everyone for listening to another episode of the Black Real Estate Dialogue podcast. Again, if you haven't already, please do subscribe leave us a five-star rating and review. I'm looking forward to hearing from you all soon. Thank you. Hi everyone, Sam here from Black Real Estate Dialogue. Make sure to hit that notification bell and that subscribe button and to visit us at blackrealestatedialogue.com.